A woman working on an extreme yoga pose has the ultimate fail and falls 80 feet from her balcony. Meanwhile, the Fitbit Versa 2 is coming out. The new smartwatch will compete with the Apple Watch and have some Alexa magic into it. And a black news anchor has to deal with a slight that wasn't meant to be a slight that the other anchor should have known was a slight. We'll get to that one in quite a bit because we really want to, I, I really want to talk about that one. But those three stories are not quite tops. You told me which stories were the actual top 10 stories for the week. And we'll get to those in just a moment here on This is the Conversation's wrap-up show with me, Jay Cleveland Payne. This is for the week ending August 31st, 2019. And welcome to the show. I am Jay Cliffin Payne. This is the wrap up show weekly presented by the This is the Conversation website and the Conversation Project. Basically, the same thing. This is the Conversation.com is a website, a project, a movement, if you will, that hopes to have the best conversations, the best conversation lists around the world. With one of my many hats I wear being a news producer, a person who produces news programming for people out there in the world, I get a chance to put my hands and touch real stories and choose the ones that I believe will have the most impact on the audience I'm reaching. This is one where I put that control into your hands. You listen to this podcast, have control of the podcast. You basically do the script. You give me the news program to give to you that I'll give to you in just a moment. Now, how does that happen? You follow the Conversation Project's social media links. On Facebook, you look for This is a Conversation. Same for Instagram as well. And for Twitter, it is TH underscore Conversation. And what happens is every 50 minutes or so, we post a brand new story from various news sources around the world. And some of these stories are the top breaking news stories. Some of the ones are the ones that get stuck Chiron all day long on your cable news channels. Some of them are rather obscure. Some of the sources are really, really uh, questionable at times. But most of them are vetted. We read through all the stories, make sure they are actual stories for the most part uh, at least that, that if if someone else got fooled I, I blame it on them and then you get a chance to react to the story either headline or go ahead and read it please we'd love you to read the stories as you wish like them love them hate them share them reply to them respond to them the more engagement that you give on facebook and twitter the higher the score goes we at the end of the week on friday mornings we put all the scores all the engagement numbers into a spreadsheet weigh them out so they're even and come up with one big total score from top to bottom and this week top to bottom means number one all the way to story listed at number 223 so we had that many different uh postings this week had some extra things we'll explain a little bit of that in the housekeeping as well but this are the stories, the biggest stories of the week, as said per you. And we thank you so much for being a part of this. Then, of course, the podcast comes out and we will give you those top 10 stories in the first segment. These are the stories that everyone around the world told us were the most engaging stories to talk about, not just what was the top stories necessarily on the headline news, although a lot of those stories are in the top 10. Our second segment of the show has what we call the housekeeping segment, and that's where we basically explain how things work a little deeper and go into detail if there's some shenanigans this week. This week, the only shenanigans is we're back to a tie, so we'll re-explain the tiebreaker again and go over the basics, how these work out. We also have the almost relevant story of the week. That story, as I said, number 222 this week, the very last story on the list, which is normally one of the last stories we post. That's the case with this one. But here's one that really is pretty irrelevant, but it is kind of funny and interesting. So when I pulled it, I was wondering whether it would make it. This one, oddly enough, made it by being the very least responded story of the week. Go figure. In the third segment, we round out the top 15. Those are stories, some of which you heard headlines in the T's and about and two more. Math isn't well today. The top five stories not in the top 10, which make them stories 11 through 15. That's pretty much how it works around here. Email the movement and the podcast directly at the conversation inbox at gmail.com or, of course, respond to us via our website and social media, and we will do our best to get back with you as quickly as possible with as best the response we can. We can always argue anything we hear here or see on the website. So let's go ahead and get into the actual dealio before we lose our places in all of this stuff. Starting off with the story in the number 10 spot. And as we said, we have a tie. I think I said that, but we have a tie. So I'll explain the tiebreaker. And oddly enough, the tie is in the 9 and 10 spots. Now, we don't keep them as a tie for 10, 
What we keep it as is the one story, the older story, basically wins out at the higher score. For those who care dental details, stick around for the housekeeping in segment two. Otherwise, story number 10 this week, Jonas Brothers and the Toronto show early. Fans continue to party. Saturday, August 24th, the day we posted this one, and we'll read you some lines from that story. We pulled it from page six, and we posted it, as we said, on Saturday. The happiness ended for Jonas Brothers fans in Toronto when the group had to cut their show short. Toronto, we're so sorry we didn't give you, get to play our last two songs, they tweeted Friday night. Unfortunately, there was an unforeseen technical difficulty, and our production team advised us to end the show. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We love you so much. Fans at the band's Happiness Begins tour at the city's Scotch Scotia Bank Arena, always messed that one up, took to Twitter immediately expressing their disappointment, especially considering that they didn't hear the band's most famous hits, their 2018 single Burning Up, and their 2019 reading hit Sucker. The Jonas Brothers ghosted me like every other man in Toronto, one disappointed fan tweeted. However, videos shared to local media show fans kept the show going by singing Burning Up in a cappella. When the Jonas Brothers dipped before Burning Up, so the fans start singing, wrote one fan who shared a video of the massive arena crowd singing their 2018 hit. The impromptu sing-along later headed into the hallways of the venue. You can read on with the stories. All the stories that we have will also be linked inside this week's link for the podcast. So go to thisistheconversation.com, click the link for the podcast, which has an ending or the week ending of August 31st, 2019. And you can check out more details on this one. This was just a cool sort of organic thing that happened. The Jonas Brothers are known for very happy concert sets and not being angry brothers. Uh, so they do what they can. Whatever happened to their set was unfortunate for the fans out there watching the concert but apparently those folks in Canada are really that nice and got over it just fine as I said the number nine story is a virtual tie with the story in the number 10 spot this one just happened to be posted later in the week so we gave it more juice for getting to the same number with less time Wednesday August 26th the day that we 28 should say today this was posted the headline is Queen approves UK government's request to suspend Parliament for Brexit ABC News is a source for this site and source for the story and if you hadn't heard let me tell you a little bit about what's going on Queen Elizabeth has approved a request by Prime Minister Boris Johnson to suspend Parliament a move that appears designed to thwart opposition lawmakers from blocking Brexit prompting pro protests in cities across the United Kingdom Johnson spoke to the Queen on Wednesday to request an end to the current Parliament session in September. The shift gives opposition lawmakers less time to block a no-deal Brexit before the UK's October 31st deadline to leave the European Union. Johnson, who has helped lead the push to exit EU in a national referendum three years ago and took over from Theresa May in July, has insisted the suspension of the Parliament had nothing to do with the blocking scrutiny of his Brexit plans and was instead about delivering on his domestic policy agenda. Go to the link inside of our website to see more of the story from ABC News or search it. A quick rundown of what's going on. Brexit is the British, the, U the UK, the U United Kingdom, British, Britain is trying to get out of its deal as being a part of the European Union. They want to be their own sovereign monetary nation again. And so they voted for it. It was apparently voted for and the people wanted it. But the parliament was not a keen on it, but the people didn't really want it. And so, so badly that they couldn't get a real plan to get out. So essentially on October 31st, they're just done. They're just like, we're out peace. Uh, there's so many crazy things going along with this. And what this move does is two things, actually. Number one, it puts the queen in charge of the monarchy without making her a monarch. The queen had to, the queen rules over parliament, but she stays away from any work. So if the prime minister asked the queen to do something, queen sort of has to do it. Otherwise the queen is actually ruling. She's, she's, she can't overrule parliament, but she rules them. Number two, as it says, it basically cuts off the, the parliament's working right now, basically ends the session for parliament. So they can't get any work done so that the, there's no actual work that be done to push back on the Brexit or fix it. Since they're just going to get out, they're just going to basically say we're done and get out at this point. There's no reason to work on fixing the Brexit. So there's no way to fix not fixing the Brexit and the people who are opposing it seem like they don't have the right amount of representation to, to work on it. 
which is actually what's happening. It's controversial. It's weird. It's very, very unprecedented. And it's just the way Parliament and the Brits are working their government right now. So back to real stats and stats that matter. The number eight story this week has a bump in response from the nine and ten, which means more people were responsive to this one than those two stories of about 7.46%. We posted it on Thursday, August 29th. The headline is Dorian heads to Florida, possibly as Category 3 after swiping Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. The source for this is NBC News. I'm not going to read the story here because I'll just give you the updates. Uh, Essentially, Hurricane Dorian has been ping-ponging around quite a bit uh, out in the Gulf. Not in the Gulf, out in the Atlantic, I should say. And as it was approaching some of the lower islands, the first thought was it's going to hit Puerto Rico and slam it pretty hard. For some reason, and we don't understand how these things happen, how they work, it did, took a turn. It hit the U.S. Virgin Islands and then took a turn where it swiped over the British Virgin Islands and just sort of corner swiped the side of Puerto Rico. It didn't go over the bulk of the eastern part as it was expected and went back into the water. But that time over the water allowed it to gain more strength and its trajectory, which kind of was still ping-ponging, now more or less settled, headed straight for Florida. If not for Florida, uh, it's at least going to bump up the East Coast somewhere, hitting somewhere near the northern part if at the at the kind of the bulk level of the model. Right now, Florida is embracing for some sort of hurricane coming in uh, with high winds on Saturday and something hitting land on Sunday. Where it will hit, nobody really knows, uh, but everyone's taking precautions. All the college football that's happening in Florida is being moved to other venues or being canceled for the weekend. People are shuttering up stuff. Water is being bought. Things are being set up. So we're bracing in for the first big hurricane of the season basically to cause the panic and havoc. And so this will be a weekend for news anchors to, as I say, be set out to die to stand in the hurricanes. It's what they do. It brings in ratings. People watch it. Seems pretty ridiculous, but it's what happens every single time. I usually pick what is my favorite story of the week out of what comes out, but this is one that is my least favorite story of the week because it's always basically my least favorite story of the week. Your headline is... Starbucks Pumpkin Cream Cold Brew. New drink and PSL arrive August 27th. We posted it on August 27th, basically early in the morning. The story was posted on on the Monday, I believe. Uh, From USA Today is the source. It gets a bumper response from the number eight story of 15.97%. And um, I'll just go quickly into this one as well. Pumpkin Spice Lattes, the PSLs, as the folks talk about, are back And you may think they're back early. I think they're back early, but since they're already selling Halloween costumes, at least been selling them for about two weeks, I guess pumpkin can't come too early for the pumpkin spice people. So if you're a PSL folk, then uh, your time has come and we'll stick around till around uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas or so. Uh, Because Starbucks is adding in its new cold brew coffee, they're adding the pumpkin spice taste to that abomination so if you're a pumpkin spice person and you like cold brew then you're doubly happy if you're me you wish you could care less but apparently everybody brings this up all the time it's, it is the thing so since it's not possible to care any less you care as little as you possibly can so we go to a story that is uh, both culturally relevant and just kind of cool to talk about Professor Matthew McConaughey, say that three times fast, Oscar-winning actor to teach at University of Texas. This story, yes, it's an actual news story, got came to us uh, this week, uh, was posted on Wednesday, August 28th, and has a bump in response, a slight bump in response from the seventh story of just 0.6%. Our host, our source for this is the Dallas Morning News, and we're going to read you a little bit about the new professor, not the nutty professor, the, uh, the all right, all right, all right professor, if I knew that was going to work. Uh, who's going to be teaching full-time, getting paid to do this? Academy Award-winning actor Matthew McConaughey has landed a new role, University of Texas professor. But it's not for a movie. McConaughey, a 1993 alum with a degree in film, was appointed professor of practice at the Moody College of Communication starting in the fall semester, which began Wednesday. The university announced that the Days of Confused actor, who has strong ties to the school, will join a department of radio, television, and film. Quote, 
He has a passion for teaching and for all things cinematic, which is palpable, even infectious, said Department Chairman Noah Eisenberg. He might have been a bit extra enough. Well, McConaughey has been a visiting instructor since 2015, co-teaching the script-to-screen film production class. Last year, university officials declared McConaughey the Minister of Culture for the school's planned basketball arena set to open in 2021. McConaughey will co-teach the script-to-screen class with Associate Professor Scott Rice. The class meets once per week for three hours, and McConaughey will attend in person as the schedule permits, said Kathleen Mabley, Director of Marketing and Communication for UT's Moody College of Communications. He also films lessons from the set that are viewed and discussed in class. McConaughey's salary each semester is dependent on the number of courses he teaches, co-teaches, just like a regular teacher, for the fall semester, he'll earn less than $10,000. So it's not chump change, but it's not necessarily a big-time movie actor money. But it is big-time movie actor doing something that's really cool. All jokes aside about Matthew McConaughey and some of the weirdness of his roles, this is a really cool gig, and we're really happy for UT for doing something like this and McConaughey for showing that he's more than just a crazy actor. He actually has the chops to keep things going along. The G7 Summit was this past weekend, but not much was dealt with on the stage for uh, any of the actual world leaders. But apparently it was not without nothing getting done over the weekend. The number five story for this week, bump in response of 11.9% from the sixth story, posted on Monday, August 26, has this headline. Fashion companies reach landmark sustainability accord ahead of G7 Summit. Fortune.com is your source for this one. And let's read a little bit about the folks that got something done, even if it was just for the sake of fashion. This afternoon at the Elysee Palace, French President Emmanuel Macron and Kerning Chairman and Chief Executive Francois-Henri Pignoul unveiled a new plan to reduce the environmental impact of the global fashion industry. Signed by 32 companies, including some of the biggest names in luxury, activewear, fast fashion, and retailing, The G7 Fashion Pact marks the first serious broad-based push by a coalition of private sector companies to help reduce global warming, replenish the planet's biodiversity, and curtail the dumping of plastics in the world's oceans. At its current growth rate, textile and apparel production emissions emissions will rise more than 60% by 2030, according to UN Climate Change. The Fashion Pact signatories have set a goal to enlist at least 20% of the global fashion industry into the effort as measured by volume and production. Quote, We have just 11 years left to halt irreversible climate change, reads the G7 Fashion Pact, which outlines three key areas where the sector can reduce emissions and waste. You can go through the whole shebang by checking out the link inside of this week's podcast at the website, thisisaconversation.com. This is actually a very interesting and very thorough breakdown of what's going on for the environment and what the fashion industry wants to do for that, which is, Good, because we're having issues with actual countries and nations not wanting to actually deal with what seems to be a problem because it's a problem that's going to be another 10, 12 years before it's irreversible. And until 10, 12 years, it won't be the current regime's problems. That's not exactly how you run a regime, but it is how we run regimes these days, apparently. Number four story this week, Disney Plus reveals three more Marvel series, She-Hulk, Ms. Marvel, and Moon Knight. This one is my actually favorite one for the week. Saturday, August 24th is when we posted this, and this was more responsive than the fifth story at 5.85%. Uh, reading from CNET.com as they revealed, or actually pretty much everyone revealed what was going on. Um, I'm not even going to read. I'm just going to skim this one as well. The new Disney Plus digital service, which has everyone freaking out because that means Netflix can't hold all the cards when it's your one-stop shop for everything digital on the replay. Disney's holding on to basically all of their catalogs. There will be no more Marvel films going to Disney when or Netflix when things are done. So they're setting things up to make sure people are watching us much similar way to, as the WWE Network did when they want to make sure they had 24 hours worth of talents and 24 hours worth of stuff to watch, even when the whole kicker was getting you there to watch their pay-per-views. 
They are doing this with lots of original series based on the franchises they own. There's Star Wars original series that are going to be basically bigger budget and very well produced. Same with the Marvel series. You've heard about some of the ones they've talked about before. This is an announcement of three new ones based on some characters that kind of often not looked at very much, and you'll have to find and figure out how they actually survive inside of the new Marvel Cinematic Universe. But She-Hulk, one of my longtime favorites, also Moon Knight, another one of my favorites, and Miss Marvel, a newer character, which is kind of an offshoot of Captain Marvel, redone in an interesting way. Real quickly, She-Hulk is the cousin of Bruce Banner. Uh, she actually has a, a accident in the comics, and her cousin gives her a blood infusion, so she gets the gamma-radiated blood put into her body. It circles through her, and she becomes a green goddess of her own. She instantly has her full faculties. She's able to do plenty of other things. She's a lawyer. She's a model. She's an Avenger, all those things as well. So we'll see how they transfer that, especially since we've already had Hulk go through all his transformations so far. Ms. Marvel is a story of a girl, and actually a Muslim girl, who gains these powers of uh, of, of manipulation of, of her body. She can stretch, she can actually change her looks and do things like that. And it's uh, she's a really cool character that shows empowerment and youth culture joining into the comic book world. And she basically takes her name from Ms. Marvel, who was formerly Captain Marvel back when she was not quite the captain. And so she takes her name, her moniker, and uses that as a source of pride, which Ms. Marvel in the comics definitely endorses. We'll see how she is done. And, of course, Moon Knight is technically uh, the Marvel version of Batman, except this Batman isn't just having psychological trauma. This one's kind of crazy and has been possessed by Egyptian gods. It gets really, really weird once you get past that part. Once you figure that part out, then it gets really weird. So, But Moon Knight, one of my favorite characters, and I always loved him when he played his roles in the comic versions of the Avengers. So it's going to be something to see. And it might be worth paying the five bucks extra for more of that programming. But if you know me, you know I'm trying to stay away from the TV stuff. It it's going to be hard hard to to keep out of, I guess. We go back to USA Today for the source for the story in the next spot. This story is number three for this week, and the headline is: California gun trainer accidentally shoots student. Please say. We posted this on Sunday, August the twenty fifth. Bump in response from the number four story, 25.63%. That many more people were into this one than the last one. So let's get you into the guts from this one. A Riverside, California man attending a firearms training class to get his concealed weapons permit was accidentally shot by a Riverside County Sheriff's deputy trainer, the department told the Desert Sun. On August 10th, the man, identified only as a civilian, was participating in a course at the Ben Clark Training Center gun range in Riverside. According to a department news release issued in response to questions from the Desert Sun, gun range staff inspect students' firearms during the course and students are instructed to unload their guns. During the inspection, the range staff member, a civilian instructor the department did not identify, administered a trigger pull test and shot the student in the leg. Range staff initially treated the injured man. Paramedics arrived and the citizen was transported to a local hospital where he received treatment for a non-life-threatening wound, according to the department's statement. The accidental discharge is being investigated by both the sheriff's, the sheriff's Paris Station staff and the staff at the Ben Clark Training Center. Brooke Frederick Rowe, a county spokeswoman, spoke in a, wrote an email in response to questions from the Desert Sun that, the injured man is a county employee who attends the training as a, quote, private citizen, unquote, and not in their work capacity. Federico also wrote, we wish our employee a speedy recovery. There's a bit more to that. So if you want to go deeper into the whole story, the fiasco, the fun up, if you want to call it that, click on the link inside of our website. This is the conversation.com. We have a link for this week's podcast with all the links to all the stories. So you can read deeper into all of them, all 16 stories uh, there for the week ending August the 31st, 2019. And of course, if you want to discuss this with me further, respond to us via email. The conversation inbox at gmail.com is where you can chat with me and we'll chat up any story you want to stories here, stories not here, complaints, send them that way. 
we will take care of them as best as we can. In a week when we posted about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon bugging Kevin Bacon, that story nowhere near this podcast this week, uh, it's always good to remember that we always have connections to people, even when we don't think they are, and how really, really creepy that can be. This story in the number two spot was a top-rated Facebook story of the week. It was posted on Sunday, August 25th. It has a bumper response from the number three story of 42.4%. And I'll give you the headlines, and then we'll give you the creepiness, the extra creepiness factor of it all. O.J. Simpson is not happy with Andrew Luck for retiring an hour after he drafted the QB in his fantasy league. Business Insider, which has given us lots of great stories, is the source for this one, which is seemingly weird, but it is what it is. So let's go into the actual story and then deal with the O.J. Simpson stuff in a hopefully very small little piece because we don't need to give O.J. much of any more run than he already has. So the story we're not really detailing in this story, although it's bits and pieces are there, is the retirement from the NFL for quarterback Andrew Luck, the quarterback more or less currently of the Indianapolis Colts, although he's retired, so there's still some technicalities on that. This is late into the preseason for the NFL, so at this point in time, the main quarterbacks aren't throwing very much. They're basically just out there to cheer on some guys and teach some guys a few things. And so what happened, based on just mental stress and just all the rehab he's been doing from all the injuries he's had in in what's a relatively short career, six years, although that's long for the average of around three and a half to four years, Andrew Luck basically thought he was done. So he made the decision and talked to his coaches and everything was ironed out for the for what's going to happen to give him a way out for the season on Saturday morning. Saturday evening during a preseason game, a reporter broke the news to the world in in the stadium before Luck could break the news on Sunday morning in his press conference, which led to a lot of boos to Andrew Luck giving up on their team. So there was an emotional press conference after the game dealing with that. There's been a lot of emotional stuff going on between there. And somewhere along the lines, O.J. Simpson and his buddies had a, had a football draft for fantasy football, and Luck was picked as one of O.J.'s quarterbacks. Now, the most important part of the story is congratulations to Andrew Luck for realizing that this isn't worth it, and he has plenty of money, and it's all about having a future and time with his family, and he can walk away because it's all about him, not about us. And we're just going to be done with OJ for the moment. We've reached the number one story for the week, and we're going to get you the stats and get through this one uh, quickly, briefly, with not the pith. I'm sure there's a lot of pith, but that's what we're going to do. Make it pithy. The story was posted on Tuesday, August 27th. This was the highest rated Twitter story of the week. This story has gets a bump response from the number two story on its own of 30.34%. From the number 10 and 9 stories, remember there was a tie of 246%. And from number sto- number story, the story numbered at 223, pardon my stutter, which is the almost irrelevant story of the week. We'll tell you about that in the next segment or what it is. It's bumper response. It was more responsive than that one by 46,300. Your headline and your story to follow, brawl involving dozens of water park uh, was over a towel. The story, we sourced it, oddly enough, from Fox News, but we saw it in a lot of different places. An alcohol-ridden brawl involved dozens of California water parks, dozens at a California water park Sunday, was sparked after two families got into a confrontation over a beach towel, police said. Pardon my bad reading. The brawl left one man in critical condition and closed business operations for the rest of the day. Police responded to Raging Waters, a water park located in Sacramento, California, around 3.28 p.m. Sunday. Christopher Neves, 35, of Modesto, was found unconscious and without a heartbeat, officials said. Paramedics performed CPR on Neves and regained his heartbeat. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where he was listed in a coma, according to Fox 8, local TV affiliate there. Everest Robillard, chief of the Cal Expo Police Department, said officers broke up a fight involving around 40 people. Two families, each with about 15 to 20 people, began arguing when an individual from one family allegedly took a beach towel belonging to a member of the other family. 
It started over beach towel and then escalated into verbal insults and profanity. One family getting angry because the profanity is being said in front of children. The next thing we know, it became physical. Robohard told that to the newspaper the next day. Robohard said alcohol was involved. One witness described how someone cracked a chair over the head of another person during the fight. Sacramento Bee reported that as well. It is unclear how Neves was injured and if anyone was charged in the incident. Water park was closed down for the rest of the day and guests were escorted off the premises. As per the end of this article, the investigation is ongoing. As we said, this was supposed to whip back, so I'm sure the investigation shows that a lot of drunk folks acting really stupid caused something really stupid. And unfortunately, as these things tend to be, a lot of them, they don't really feel bad about it. We had the story a few weeks ago. We had a couple stories about brawls in Disney World and people go acting up at Disney World. Uh, but apparently acting up in public is the new thing these days, which is why I tend to not hang out in public. That's it. That's the story you guys said was the most responsive, the most interesting, the one that you most conversated about among yourselves inside of the Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a problem with that, then you need to conversate with more stories unlike that one in the Facebook and Twitter. And that's simple. Go to Twitter and follow us at TH underscore conversation. Go to Facebook, look for This is a Conversation, and simply follow us. And as we drop the stories in the feed, about one every 50 minutes, respond to them as you want to. Like it, love it, hate it, share it, respond to it, reply to it, reply to me. And the more engagement a story gets, the higher the score it adds up at the end of the week. And we tell you from 10 to 1 or how it goes out. And this week, number one. Another big fight, another big brawl at a public place, this time at a water park over towel. Coming up next, we will go into the housekeeping, re-explaining how things work and, of course, the tie thing, and tell you what the story actually is for the 222nd story of this week. This one really is kind of irrelevant, but I think you'll get a kick out of it anyway. Coming up next here on This is the Conversation's weekly wrap-up show with me, Jake Cleveland Payne. This is for the week ending August the 31st. 2019. The Conversation Project, the website, this is the conversation.com, the Facebook feeds, the Twitter feed, and of course, this podcast is powered by you. So essentially, you know, NPR style, we ask you for help to make sure this thing keeps going. It's labor intensive. It takes a lot of work, despite the fact that I barely can read sometimes. It is a lot of effort putting into this thing for something that a lot of people do love. So we ask you a couple things. Either go to the website, click on the links for this week's podcast, and you can see how you can help us out by being a Patreon supporter. You can also just check out any of the sponsors we have here on the website and inside of these things. And of course, we have the, the ads that run too as well. That helps us pay things as well as well via our provider for our service provider for our podcast. And we also sponsor or also highlight a sponsor every single week as one of our favorites. And we don't have a problem showing favorites because the ones we do are really great, really great advertisers. This week, we're back to cloud nine living who's been with this podcast well before it was a podcast, well before it was uh pivot into the news thing. It was, Cloud9 Living is something I've been using as great to have them as advertisers and great to have them as partners for a long time. And in fact, it's something that I use fairly frequently when we go on vacations. One of the biggest ones I, I talked about was my wife's desire to drive a race car. My wife's a horrible driver, and she wanted to drive a race car, and we wanted to be nowhere near near that. Cloud9 Living had an experience where she can get and drive on a real track in a real race car. And while she was there, my daughter and I went to a museum. As weird as that sounds... We had fun at the museum. She had fun driving a race car, and Cloud9 Living made it happen. They have over 2,000 different experiences like that in places anywhere you're nearby. nearby. Somewhere near you is an experience, something like you want to do. And if it's not, that might be your excuse to not be near you, your excuse to take a trip. And these are the really cool things about Cloud9 Living. You can pay for an experience straight out. You can go there and look for their menu of things they have and pay for it directly. You can buy a gift certificate for whatever amount you want to and hold on to it until you're ready to take that trip. If you decide when that trip happens and you've paid for an experience already and you don't want to do that, they'll refund you the money completely or they will exchange it for an equal value trip on the, on the dot. If you buy a gift certificate and you take a long, long time to figure out what you want to do, 
that gift certificate, gift, gift certificate will never lose value. You don't lose a dollar every month. You don't use the gift certificate. It's always for the value you have. And if you go to the links inside of our website, you'll get an extra special deal for getting gift certificates. The best way to do it is just buy a gift certificate and give it to whoever you want to so they can do whatever crazy thing they want to. They can enjoy their excursion and their insanity on their own. Or you can do things that are more down to earth and much slower. They have golf excursions. They have romantic dining. They have hot air balloons, which is about as high as the speed I want to. Yes, they have fast cars and scuba diving as well. Find one of over 2,000 experiences nationwide at Cloud9 Living and use our link. This is the conversation.com slash Cloud9. That's the numeral nine. This is the conversation.com slash Cloud9. And you can get a great deal on gift certificates or go ahead and book your excursion if you're ready to go for it. Check them out. They'll take good care of you. They are Cloud9 Living. Let's get our housekeeping out of the way. This is where we go over a quick, a quick explanation of how things work around here and go over any shenanigans for the week. How do things work? And I've basically explained it every single segment, every other story or two throughout the actual first segment of the show. You get your votes in for this podcast by simply going to our social media sites or actually just look at them, look at them in whatever you use to check them on your social media as we post our links every single 50 minutes. Respond to the links at in kind, like them, love them, hate them, share them, do whatever you want to do and engage with the problems, engage with the with the headlines, read the stories, engage with those. The more engagement that a story gets, the higher the score it gets. We add the Twitter and the Facebook, weigh them out and come up to the one standard number to go from top to bottom. As you said this week, top is number one, as always bottom is number two, twenty three. From there, we scan the top 25 to 30 to make sure that any stories in that range are not duplicate stories or updates to stories or stories that would uh, combine to make two stories that are essentially the same inside of the top 10 countdown or just close enough that it should actually manage to push the story down. If we do that and combine two stories, you combine, we combine the stats, give you the headlines for them and tell you how they fit together. We call that a super story. And when super stories come, we tell you about those. Those are normally things like we'll have updates for Dorian coming up as the week goes along. We'll probably have two or three stories in the week that rank fairly high. We'll put them together as one number so they don't take up a bunch of different spots in the countdown. We also have issues right now where things are tied. If two stories are literally tied for the raw number, uh, we don't like to have tied numbers. Don't say they're tied for number 10 or tied for number 9. We tie break them in one of two ways, or actually one of three ways. The first way is the youngest story is the highest ranking. The story that got to that number fastest with less time gets the first ranking spot. If they're both posted on the same day, so they're both generally the same amount of time, we next go to the engagement on Facebook. We go to the story that gets most engagement inside of Facebook, uh, inside of a, not so much impressions, how many times it was seen, because that goes into the raw score that goes into the tops and bottoms. We go into how many in actual engagements, how many people really got deep, deeper into it, because engagements on Facebook are usually more dramatic than the engagements on Twitter. The Twitter engagements are essentially one-to-one. -one. The engagements on Facebook are a little bit more nuanced, so we go from there. Uh, from there, we have another super top secret way to break the top that we're not going to go into unless we actually have to use that sometime. So we have the, the fairness. We have a, it's essentially a coin flip for all practical purposes, but the computer figures it out and it will sort it out that way as well. So with all that done, we, of course, we have the tie this week in the 10 and 9 spot, which is uh, unusual for our tie spot, usually in the more, more higher up. But this story is what the Queen approving the Brexit or the Parliament suspension to basically make sure Brexit happens. And Jonas Brothers leaving the concert early, but the concert goers singing anyway. Uh, those were our stories that were tied right off the bat. Let's go to the story that is at uh, number 223. And the quick explanation on the almost irrelevant story of the week. We go through a, a, a linking from Friday to Friday. So basically we pull the numbers more or less by... Uh, 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning on friday central time where i am we pull everything out of the ranks and we put them into the spreadsheet and work from there uh, so we look from the previous friday which is more or less midnight to whenever i pull the numbers so sometimes i pull them a little early 
Sometimes they get up early. Who knows? Sometimes they get a little late. And so that's the range that we go from. And they're not, they're not, it's not exactly eight full days. It's more seven days and five or six or so hours or so. We go, say, Friday to Friday. With that said, we go and we rank them out. And the stories that are usually posted late Thursday, early Friday, which don't have a lot of time to gain much response, are usually the ones at the very bottom. And sometimes the ones... They may make it into this countdown the next upcoming week because they have a full eight days of gain. Most cases, they don't. Number the very last, last, very last, last, last story is usually its best place of getting in there. And it's always something that is usually something more important than it ought to be. Uh, so we call it almost irrelevant. This one is pretty irrelevant, but it is pretty freaking funny. Wives are bribing their husbands with sex to get chores done. New York Post posted this one, and we put it on our feeds on Friday, August the 30th. Uh, We don't give much nuance at all to this one, other than the fact that it's it's ranked number 223 out of 223, and the number one story was more responsive to this one. More people were in on that one by about 46,000%, 46,300 to be exact. We will read you the story, because the story itself, you know, if, if if, if this is your situation, congratulations. If it's not your situation, then you and your spouse can can bring it up among yourselves. Romance isn't dead. It just has to do the dishes. Chore play, exchanging, exchanging chores for sex, is on the rise and making waves on social media. Wives are cheekily coupling the hashtag chore play with images of perfectly tidy playrooms and freshly mopped floors to show that their husbands have been busy around the house and they're They've been about and they're about to get busy in bed as a reward. So I don't know why I couldn't read that. Fans of the practice, such as Kimberly Huma, 38, says it's a fun, effective way to keep the household running smoothly. I'm sure it is. Quote, husbands absolutely should do chores without a carrot on a stick, just like moms should be able to get through a day with toddlers without drinking wine by 3 p.m. And kids should be able to put their shoes on without promises of cheesy snacks says a San Diego marketing consultant and mother of three-year-old twins. But where's the fun in that? Amanda Mocott, a blogger and mom of in Middlesburg, Massachusetts, is also on Team Chore Play. Her quote, As a working mom, the last thing I want to do when I get home from work is do more work like laundry and dishes, says a 32-year-old. If my husband wants to no questions ask free pass for sex, he will get it if he checks off the boxes, especially if he does so before he's asked. But the practice is stirring up controversy online, and experts say in relationships. When popular Instagram influencer Bree Dietz shared an image of her 79,678 followers of her and her husband kissing while holding up a letterboard reading, helping with housework so you can get lucky is called chore play, she received nearly 900 comments but not all of them complimentary. This story is a little long, so there's a lot more to read if you check, click the link at our website for this week's podcast, the week ending August 31st, 2019 at thisisaconversation.com. And as you can see, it's a bit controversial. Now, there's, there's no way we can get around the thought process of there's never been a time when someone has offered up a little nookie for a little bit of extra uh, motivation to get things done. There's no way we can't say that. But in the age of social media where we share all sorts of things that we probably shouldn't share and we get into a sort of a rut where we believe some of these sitcom live things that really seem funny on TV as really how things happen, 3, 3 p.m. wine drinking for one, it gets a little bit annoying and it becomes a big issue for people trying to live their lives in real ways. So if chore play is your way to get your husband to get things done and he's okay with you saying it out loud to the world and sharing it in their social media feeds, then more power to you. Otherwise, keep that to yourself and just show off the clean house and say your hubby did it just because he loves you, not because he wants to love you. Yeah, something like that. Coming up in mere moments, we're going to talk about shout outs. That's going to be shouting out to the people who gave us extra love inside of social media this week. And we will round up the top 15, talk about the stories that weren't quite in range as a best story this week, but still pretty good on the most part from the range here 
on This Is The Conversation's weekly wrap-up show with me, Jay Cleveland Payne. This is for the week ending August the 31st, 2019. Because I produce a lot of inspirational podcasts for my own company and for other clients, I listen to a lot of inspirational podcasts because I want to hear what other people sound like, hear what they're doing, hear what deliver they're having, hear what messages they're giving out there. And one that I've been listening to for quite some time is a very simple one called Be Great Today. It's listed as weekly inspiration to start your week. And it's given a new episode every Sunday. It's produced by a man named Jonathan Bloom, who also goes by Frasley Sparkspan on World of Warcraft. So you may know him in either form, his his real life form or his actual avatar form for the game. But he's essentially just being being positive for all purposes. A new show comes out every single Sunday, so you get a quick bit of motivation. Most of the shows are less than five minutes. Most of the shows are about three minutes of just him giving you that at information to be great today. It's a simple way to find him. It's at b b e dash great dot today. B dash great dot today. You can find his website or you can find him all over the Googles and by searching wherever your pods or casts, he's there as well. Uh, give him a, a a listen, give him a try, and then give a message that that you heard about him here from being spot being spotlight here from this is a conversation.com. Like I said, no one is really, there's no paid endorsements for these podcasts. These are all just podcasts that I enjoy that I listen to because I'm a podcaster and produce a lot. I listen have listened to a lot of them for industry purposes and just for personal purposes. And this is one that I listen to every single Monday myself. Check it out. It is be great today at B dash great dot today. It is the podcast we're spotlighting for this week. Time for the shout out showing the extra love we can give to those who showed us extra love on the t- social media, on the Facebooks and the Twitter. It's given us just uh, extra responses, liking, loving and sharing things from our social media. So we're sharing their names out and hopefully you will enjoy them as well. If you, if you hear your name, send me an email or reach out to me via the social medias. Of course, email is the conversation inbox at gmail.com. Let me know what we can do to make things better or in some cases, just stop being so whatever it is we're being whatever day it is special love on the facebook first to ellie video productions llc also ruth ann miller one of our usual suspects here marcia white biz as well uh we have dimitriel garrison and clarence e springer on the line uh deborah lee scott jumped in this week big o as well sherry sides uh also popped in this week and some love coming to us from trey sutton switching over to the twitter folks people who gave us extra love at th underscore conversation Going out to Women for Survival, hashtag release the full report. So, yeah, we got you guys. Release the full report. AARP Goddess, who, of course, gave us some tips for some great stories to post this week. News Brew as well. SSG Boots. We have Kate, The Spun, Loretta, The Media Matters, and Paranoid Fan. Thank you, Paranoid Fan, for, thank you for being paranoid, for just being you, and for supporting us this past week on our social media. Now, let's go ahead and get ready to end this whole thing by rounding out the top 15. This is the part of the, t- of the story, part of the tale, the part of the show where we go through the stories at 11 through 15, the stories that aren't quite in range or close to range, but not quite in the range of the 10 in the top 10 spots. We'll give you a little bit of why we think they didn't make it here or there, but not much context other than where they ranked and the date that they were posted. There's no reason to beat ourselves up with the extra work, and you guys don't care that much. So these are just some of the stories, some of which you've heard the headlines in the tease of stories that weren't quite good enough because you guys said they weren't for this week. At number 11 this week, the headline is Neil Casal dead at 50. Spin.com is the source for this. We posted on Wednesday, August 28th. Here Here are, here is, a few words from the article they posted for his obituary per their words. Neil Casal, a guitarist who had played in the great many bands over the years, has died. A 
A Brooklyn Vegan points out, as Brooklyn Vegan points out, Casal's Instagram page reported his death this morning. No cause of death has been revealed. Casal was 50. Casal was born in Rockaway, New Jersey, and his first came to prominence in 1988 when he joined the long-running Southern rock band Blackfoot, staying with them until 1993. In 1995, Casal released Fade Away Diamond Time, the first of 10 solo albums. He kept releasing solo albums over the years while playing with a long succession of American leading bands. You can read all the deep bands, including some really big names that he's played with over time uh, by going to the link inside of this week's website. The website's always there. The link at the website for this week's podcast yeah, I'm a professional. I've been doing this 17 years. Uh, the, wink, the link is for the podcast for the week ending August 31st, 2019. Uh, yes, I am a professional. I read for a living, and um, I'm very bad at it when I read for my own projects. So there you go. If you have any suggestions for someone to help co-host, by all means, send them my way because I will take the suggestions. The number 12 story was going to be my favorite story of the week, but it's really morbid to think of it that way. So we're just going to take it as it is. If you've been with me long enough, you know my sense of humor. You know what any news person's sense of humor is. And you know where what I you kind of can read where I'm going with this as I go into this. But here is the headline. The story posted Tuesday, August 27th. Woman falls 80 feet from balcony while practicing yoga. New York Post is where we eventually pulled the story from. Uh, As I was looking this up and saw the story pop up, it was everywhere. Everybody had their own spin on it. And this was the most, or I should say, maybe the the least um, offensive of the headlines I could pull and for the least offensive of the stories I could pull. And oddly enough, it came from the New York Post, which is a tabloid-ish story, tabloid-ish newspaper with its stories. But you can go to the website and see the picture of her doing an example of a pose, obviously not the pose that, that was specifically there, but just one of the poses that she was probably doing when she fell. Let me read you some of the stories for a bit of context, and you can work it from there. A Mexican college student is alive after falling 80 feet from her balcony while practicing a yoga pose. Alexa Teresa's 23 was known to do yoga on her sixth-floor apartment balcony, often using the guardrail as a prop for extreme poses. But a risky move nearly cost Yogi her life on Saturday afternoon as she slipped and landed on the pavement outside her building in the northeastern Mexican state of Nuevo León, according to reports on El Imparcical. The health and nutrition student at Technological de Monterrey was treated by paramedics with the Red Cross and Nuevo León civil protection. They brought the, then brought to the hospital where she underwent 11 hours of surgery. She was considered to be in critical condition as of Monday, having suffered fractures to both legs and arms, hips, and head. El Imparsacio reported that the doctors had to, quote, reconstruct, unquote, her legs, and that it may be three years before she walks again. People on social media ask their followers to consider giving blood to help her. As of Sundays, a relative of Teresa's tweeted that there is no need. There's more to the story, a little more to the story, so you can read the rest of it by going to our website, thisisaconversation.com, and click the link for this week's podcast. Uh, this is one where I advise you to be very careful with your yoga, especially your extreme yoga, especially when you're doing it from very high places. This is something that obviously could have been prevented, but you know you have to do you have to up your game to be on the social media thing, to be a real influence in the show folks thing, so... This is something that I'm sure she'd wish she'd have practiced her yoga someplace more safe after this encounter. Let's keep it moving because we're trying to keep things pithy, keep things moving these days, trying to keep things on the go. And hopefully you think we're doing a good job. If we're not doing a good job, you can also reply to us at the website, thisisconversation.com, or, of course, via the email, the conversation inbox at gmail.com. Let us know how good we're doing at being good or how bad we're doing at not being so good. Story in the number 13 spot this week is, has or has a headline of Fitbit Versa 2 smartwatch with Amazon Alexa announced for $200. This story also posted Wednesday, August the 28th. Uh, we have this source from CNBC. Uh, the same day we sourced a bunch of other tech things that came out that day. Uh, so I'll give you a quick rundown on this new device here. 
Fitbit is upgrading its Versa line or essentially making a brand new Versa line that's going to be a direct competitor with Apple Watch. And to do that, it needs a little more guts into its mechanism, a little more brain, if you will. And it's going to add Amazon Alexa to the watch. Uh, it is going to launch on the 15th of September. It also has a real sleep tracker, not just a tracker that, that could cause movement. Apple Watches don't track sleep that well. And it's going to change the version of the screen, a whole bunch of things right there. The price tag for Fitbit 2, Versa 2, I should say, is one ninety nine ninety nine ninety five, dollars which is basically $200. Uh, the premium edition will come out with an extra 30 bucks on the price tag for that. You can find out more details on the watch by going to the website and clicking the link for this week's podcast and see the watch and see the pieces and see if you're ready to downgrade your Apple Watch or upgrade your other watch to see if you're ready for a smarter Fitbit, an even smarter Fitbit. Uh, if there needs to be any sort of, um, you know, disclaimers, I actually own a Fitbit Versa right now, had it since Thanksgiving, and it is a great watch to go with. Um, if I were in the look, looking for a new watch, basically I got the watch because the wife wanted it. The Fitbit Versa 2 would probably be where I'd go. We are not quite Apple fans. We don't own Apple products. Wife has an iPad, and that's a long story there. But we're Android folks and the other folks, folks, so... Being a little leery of Alexa is, is still there, but since the Android's version is not so great, that would be my my thing. So not sure why I even ramble about that. Not sure what the point of that even was, but we're going to move on to story number 14. In the 14th spot, we go to Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, instant not so happy in his life. And there have been some updates on this, so we'll quickly go through the story here. But the headline posted from TMZ because that's how they post things. Shark Tank star Kevin O'Leary boat involved in fatal crash. Tuesday, August 27th, the day it was posted. And remember, his boat was involved in a fatal crash. He didn't die in the crash. The people in the other boat, some of them died. That's where it got really confusing and hard to understand. it. But that's how most of the headlines read, was Kevin O'Leary involved in fatal crash or boat involved. Um, and there it goes there. Two people died from the injuries total. There have been plenty of updates going into this thing. What they're looking for is uh, basically video of the incident where the boats collided that, that caused the issue going there. It happened late Saturday night. It happened in the dark. A lot of things going on happened in this, this issue. So to get the full details, especially from TMZ, which just went update crazy as it got more details, they don't tend to rewrite the stuff. They just put little blurbs that put it out of order. Check out the link at the website. I know I say that a lot because that's because it's a great way to get up in all the stories. All 16 stories we talk about this week are linked to you, linked to us, linked to them, at the website. This is a conversation.com. Click the link for this week's podcast, the podcast for the week ending August 31st, 2019. And so all things must eventually come to an end, and so does this podcast. We end it with a story that is very, very disturbing to me, disturbing to a lot of my friends and my compatriots in journalism, and just, just really a bad look of a case of someone who... People who work for a living where they talk out loud and they should be thinking before they say things, saying things that seem to be just uh, seem to be innocent, seem to be silly, seem to be throwaways that instantly are not. Here's the headline. A black news anchor was compared to a gorilla on live TV by one of his colleagues, and he's using it as a powerful lesson that words matter. Business Insider gave us that one on Tuesday, August 27th. I'm going to read you as much of this thing as just the article as I can because it's that's basically the best way to 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 put it together to to colonize it. A black news anchor was compared to a gorilla by a colleague during a live broadcast and while he accepted the coworker's apology, he's using it as a personal powerful lesson to remind people that words matter. During a broadcast last Thursday, Alex Housden a morning anchor for KOCO, a TV news station in Oklahoma City, ended a segment about a gorilla at the Oklahoma City Zoo by comparing the animal to her co-anchor, Jason Hackett, saying, Kind of looks like you. Hackett responded, He kind of does, actually, yeah. The clip was shared on Facebook where people criticized Houston's comment, calling it unbelievable. You can see the clip by going to the website and clicking the link for this story. The following day, Houston issued a tearful on-air apology to Hackett, saying her comment was inconsiderate. 
It was inappropriate and I hurt people, Halston said. I want you to know I understand how much I hurt you out there and how much I hurt you, she added, turning to Hackett. She said she would never do anything on purpose to hurt Hackett. I want you all to know from the bottom of my heart, I apologize for what I said, Halston said. I know it was wrong and I am sorry. Hackett accepted Halston's apology and said that while he considers her a close friend, his comments hurt his feelings. What she said yesterday was wrong, Hackett said. It cut me deep, and it cut deep for a lot of you in the community. Hackett said that the incident could be used as a teachable moment to tell people that words matter. We're becoming a more diverse country, and there's no excuse. We have to understand the stereotypes. We have to understand each other's backgrounds and the words hurt. The words that cut deep, Hackett said. We have to have a way to replace those words with love and words of affirmation as well. So, yeah, I'm not going to go too deep into the blacky, black, 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 black commentary because we're going long in, in the show itself. But this is a, something that should really have been avoided. She should have known good and well not to do that. It seemed like a funny aside and it seemed like really quip and, and witty at the time. But comparing... African Americans, black folks, two monkeys is a long standing trope that white supremacists tend to love to do. So if you're doing that, you may not be a white supremacist, but you're basically playing their game and basically putting the words from their mouth into your own mouth. You should know this. A person like this, an anchor who's worked with a, a diverse group of folks for such time, should have known that was not the right thing to say. She didn't. She apologized. I give her that. I give her co-anchor that for off for taking the apology and taking it sincerely. But of course, he took it a step a step up to make it a greater mission to remind folks that these are things you people should know. And this is one of those you people things where I really am doing the point my finger at you people. I'm a person who deals with a very diverse group of people in my newscast every day and the people I talk to, and I'm very aware of who they are, both racially, both uh, socioeconomically, who they are, who I'm talking to, and what type of mindset that I'm feeding into. And so if a story has very basic tenets that must be told, we tell the very basic tenets as details, as fact, and if there are nuances that get really sketchy really fast, we will explain the nuances as they are explained to us. We don't claim the nuances and we leave the rest to the commentary where you can take what you will from whatever you want to. We try not to, uh, we try not to prosthetize too much stuff in the news because that's just not what it's done. We try to give you information, try to tell you what it is you need to know, what it, how it may or may not affect you. We do our best to not tell you what to think. Some organizations are all about telling you what to think. My work, when I try it, I try not to. But I do tell you, you should think more about giving more to us in our Patreon accounts to help us keep things going. You should consider it because you've listened this far, so obviously you got some some sort of value from the podcast. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of effort, and apparently I need new glasses, so we can use a little bit of help to make those things happen, keep the thing going. Patreon, you can find us at thisisaconversation.com slash Patreon. You can go to our website and just click on the links and buy from our sponsors there because we get an affiliate click back from everything that's sold there. You definitely should visit our Spotlight sponsor this week, which is Cloud9 Living. Their link is thisisaconversation.com slash Cloud9, number nine, of course, and they can give you a great fantasy excursion or a nice, peaceful, boring excursion anywhere you can think of for a great price. And the good thing is the price never changes, and if you get a gift certificate and don't pick something, the gift certificate never loses value. Check that out as well. Also, check out Be Better Today at b better dot today. It's a great podcast. It's a very quick podcast. Give you inspiration at the beginning at the beginning of the week every single week, and just do what you do to keep this thing going, which is simple. Follow us on the social medias on Facebook and on Instagram. We are this is the conversation. Twitter, we're th under th underscore conversation, and as you see in your feeds, every fifty minutes or so, a news news story pop up. Engage in it if you if you please. If it's something you'd like to get into, jump on in. If it's something you want to skip on, 
That doesn't hurt our feelings. Just get in the next one. Like it, love it, hate it, share it. Do what you need to do to engage with the story. And the more engagement each story gets, higher score it makes every week or the lower score it gets every week to be the almost relevant story of the week. This whole thing revolves around a couple of things to get the information out. We have now working on essentially four days a week giving you a newsletter with the top news stories that are coming out. Uh, on Monday, we give you the full weekend, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we give you the, the past day. You can see what's basically trending to be possibly in the podcast every week, every morning. You can go to the website, subscribe for that. You can also subscribe to the podcast if you're not already subscribed. If you are, thank you. If you are, you need to find more folks to join in the conversation. Find your friends, find some enemies, go to random strangers, grab their phones, open up their podcast apps, and subscribe to the podcast, hand it back to them, and then say thank you, and then subscribe five more times because we need plenty of folks in the discussion. Like I said, if you're not in the discussion, make sure you subscribe to yourself as well. We're pretty much anywhere your pods are cast, so if we're not there, email us at the conversation inbox at gmail.com. We will figure that out. Email me directly at jclevenpain at gmail.net and check out my main website, jclevenpain.net, and we can figure out how you can see more stuff we have going on. With that, we're going to cut it loose. The customary three thank yous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll be here next week with another edition going through the stories, counting them down from 10 to 1, letting you know what you let me know. The real top news stories of the week, as said per you. What's the most conversational things to talk about? We'll talk about what's going to be conversational next week on This is the Conversation's wrap-up show with me, Jay Cleveland Payne, coming up next week. <laughs>